Uh, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Devarian Baldwin, the Paul E. Rather Distinguished Professor of American Studies at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, and most recently the author of In the Shadow of the Ivory Tower, How Universities Are Plundering Our Cities, which will be the subject of today's keynote address. Dr. Baldwin is an engaged academic and practitioner that centers his work on African-American diasporic experiences in the United States, as well as globally. And we've had great conversations with him over the last couple of days, and we're very excited to have this conversation today with him about town and gown relations and his thoughts, uh, both reflecting on US examples, as well as some Canadian examples. So Dr. Baldwin, uh, it is my pleasure to have you present today and please take it away. Thank you so much, AJ. It really, 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 truly is a pleasure and an honor to be here. I have such wonderfully uh, fond memories of, of, of Canada through my good friend and colleague who was actually on the call, Paul Lowry from York University. Um, and it's wonderful to, meet, to be with new friends like yourself, AJ. And I thank the president, President Shepard, for being here and Western University uh, more broadly for offering sponsorship alongside the Town and Gown Association of Ontario. Um, as a part of this amazing convening entitled The Road Ahead. Um, and that, that is a perfect way to explain and explore what we have in front of us is this notion of road ahead. I know that when I come into certain meetings and rooms, the, the subtitle of my book, How Universities Are Plundering Our Cities, can be quite provocative. And, 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 and in polite Canada, that can kind of throw people off. Uh, but it, it really is a, a provocation. It is a table setting to have a more robust conversation about what is the road ahead for us all throughout North America. Um, so I'm gonna start with uh, sharing my screen and uh, starting with some Canadian examples and convening around kind of a, a North American question and then pushing forward with um, some of the US examples I just explored in my book and we can go from there. So I'm gonna do what we all have tried to do over the last three years to some success, to some failure. I'm going to try and share my screen. Wish me luck. <laughs> <laughs> can you all see my screen? Can you see uh, this slide? Are we all yes. in? Yes, we are. Okay, fantastic. We, we've arrived. We're here. So the title for my uh, remarks this afternoon are The Unspoken Impacts of Higher Education. Let me just turn my timer on and make sure that I'm on according to plan. So... As the scholarship of Nick Revington and Alexander Ray point out, Waterloo has been a central node for the nation's high-tech industrial sector, which comes with an explicit coordination with the city's higher education institutions, including the University of Waterloo and Wilfrid Laurier University. In the 2000s, um, enrollment rapidly increased in these higher education institutions but the schools continually had no interest in building complementary student housing, which fell to the private housing market. In this moment, we witness the increased duplexing of uh, 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 despite city rules, which means the density rules were flouted and marginally legal additions were built, which increased noise complaints and property damage. In response, we see an attempt to concentrate student housing on main streets, but with no amenities. Student enrollment continued to grow, and we see the growth of what would be called student ghettos. By 2012, we have the rise of the North Dale Plan, which allowed for higher densities and mixed-use spaces for amenities to attract young professionals and families to offer a greater balance between students and non-students. This effort of de-studentification, new planning attempts to bring about a greater balance, again, between student and non-students to break up these student ghettos by building out public infrastructure that includes streetscaping, parkland, light rail sectors and connectors. But we find that with this influence or impact on trying to draw in particular kinds of populations outside of the student sector, we have the rise of what was pointed out as class-based exclusions. High amenity, high amenity mixed use areas come at a higher cost, because in that emphasis, we see fewer amenities for lower income families. And so in this phenomenon, we find the limits of a market-driven redevelopment approach. 
at some level. Now we turn to Montreal, not in Ontario, but still in Canada, an important story. In 2019, we see the rise in the back of the screen of the new science campus at the University of Montreal. But in the building out of this uh, new structure, the university failed to build student housing and the city of Montreal broke promises to build social housing. The effects were um, uh, influential in terms of the destructive impacts on the park extension neighborhood. Property costs soar, we see a rise in evictions and the increase in luxury apartments and ultimately low income and immigrant communities are displaced. So what do these stories, the story of Waterloo in Ontario and Montreal and Quebec have to do, um, what do they have to do with each other? And how do they fit into the larger story what I, that I wanna tell? Well, I argue that they are both a part of a larger North American story. Now I am not, let me be clear, I am not an Ontario expert, but I do know town gown relations. So I hope you will listen to what I'm about to deliver and dismiss what doesn't apply and see what is still relevant in the efforts to build out a more comprehensive vision together of the North American town gown political economy. And I wanna emphasize that because when we talk about town gown relationships, we primarily talk about teaching classes, student realities, but we rarely situate these anecdotal or individual aspects within a larger understanding of town gown as a broader political economy for our cities and towns. And that's the story that I wanna tell this afternoon. So as we've heard today, from the very opening statement from the mayor, all the way to the president of the, of the university, we know that colleges and universities, they bring ideas and people together. And they become this magnetic pull to help anchor new innovations. They become the face of today's prosperity. Not far away from you at the University of Toronto, it is your own Richard Florida. Who, he not, I mean, he's not a native Canadian, but he's, he teaches there, who has put forward and has manufactured and mass produced this idea of the creative city as a cultural and economic draw for uh, struggling, returning cities. And at the center of this notion of creative cities is to build out universities. Because the idea here is that they bring people and ideas together and they generate innovations that are economic, political, and social. As was said earlier, because of the magnetic pull of universities, we, we want students to stay. And we want companies that they draw to come into our cities and invest. And throughout North America, colleges and universities and their biotech and medical partners have become the biggest employers, real estate holders healthcare providers, and even policing agents, either directly or through proxy, in major cities and towns throughout the continent. But with such importance, we have seen higher education's growing control over the economic development and urban governance in urban environments, or what I call the rise of universities. And as the cases of Waterloo and Montreal and York University and Simon Fraser in, in BC and other examples suggest, there is also a cost for all this town ground growth, for those living in the shadows of these expanding ivory towers. What do I mean? Campus expansions also raise housing costs and displaced residents in neighborhoods that largely surround campuses or that have become the sites of student ghettos. Higher education's broad control over labor can lower wage ceilings and suppress collective bargaining efforts. Nonprofit university medical centers have increasingly emphasized profitable boutique services like cancer research 
and plastic surgery um, over indigent, indigent and community care. Campus police forces or um, various agents that work on behalf of preserving the campus experience, whether it be on the campus or downtown. They surveil and profile residents in ways that prioritize the preservation of the university experience. Now, even if schools don't hold all of this power, we are witnessing greater swaths of our cities being turned into a campus. So in what follows, I'm gonna give you some examples that draw primarily from the US experience that I cover in my book, but again, I want you to see what's relevant, dismiss what's not. And from that, I hope that we can have ample time to have a robust conversation again about building out a mapping of the North American town gown landscape as a political economy. So drawing from the US experience, some of these examples will be relevant, some of them will be not. I asked the question, well, how did we get here? How do we get here to the rise of these universities, whether in small or large scale? Well, in the mid-century, the, mid, the, the middle of the 20th century, we witness in cities all throughout the continent periods of white or middle-income flight. Universities, however, were left in cities. They weren't as nimble. They couldn't move. They couldn't follow to prosperity into the suburbs. So instead, they bunkered themselves down behind institutional walls, or in some cases, state-funded demolitions. And they became celebrated as what we call anchor institutions. By the time we get to the 80s, they are, they are, are rebranded as economic engines of cities on the rebound. By the time we get to the 1990s, we start witnessing the children of suburban sprawl looking to turn back into urban locales, what we call the back to the city movement. And to meet and compete, various cities began to create urban policies of underwriting tech and startup and design laboratories and incubators, conversion, converting warehouses into loft housing and instituting quality of life policing that they would hope to be able to compete with each other over drawing empty nesters and young professionals back into cities. At the same time, whether it be public schools or private schools, universities are facing diminished contributions from states and provinces in their contribution to higher education. In an effort to compensate for shrinking governmental budgets, we begin to see an interest convergence between cities and universities. On one hand, you have cities trying to think differently about how to retrofit their cities and towns to make them attractive to the back to the city movement people. And on the other side, you have universities looking for ways to be more entrepreneurial. Well, how do they converge? Because when you think about those who are turning to the cities, what is their idea of urban life coming from the suburbs? Walkability, density, museums, coffee shops, fully wired, waterfront development, bookstores, cafes, restaurants. In essence, the new vision of the city was a campus. So there becomes this interest convergence between universities and city leaders in thinking about the campus as a planning model for the future of the city and transferring political and economic power over to universities to help cities come back as various interests begin to converge and look anew at urban life. In this context, the ivory tower becomes the new smokestack of the 21st century North American city. 
at the center of the story is the rise of the knowledge economy. Here, the university becomes the new face of deindustrialized capitalism. In this context, academic research is used to create profitable goods or patents in a range of fields from pharmaceutical industries and software products to health services and military defense weaponry. Key to recruiting the best students, faculty, and their families back into these cities to do this knowledge work is creating urbane clusters of laboratories, housing, retail, and nightlife. These variously called innovation districts, or what you see on the screen, what the Wexford Development Company called knowledge communities, sit right in the middle of existing communities that are working class or in the US primarily working poor and black and brown, that's surround campuses where the land is relatively cheap and the political power most vulnerable. So all throughout the US, you have companies like Wexford that are building out these knowledge communities in St. Louis, in Los Angeles, in Philadelphia, in Miami, to create this convergence of retail, nightlife, uh, uh, laboratories, and housing to bring in these knowledge workers in these full urbane experiences that are safe, profitable, and lucrative for both higher education and for cities. So in this context, the campus as the urban design model has become a planning mechanism to build out universe cities by retrofitting neighborhood blocks to maximize wealth extraction based on land control, labor management, and in some cases, because of the university interests, the privatization of governance. And in my own experiences in the US, you've, we're starting to see, especially during the pandemic, both citizens and politicians now beginning to ask the question, beginning to rethink what makes higher education actually good for the public? Well, in that context, I wanna draw your attention to at least three key areas that have become sites of conversation, land, labor, and in the US context, policing. So first, land. Colleges and universities have become the biggest landholders in their cities. And people are asking, what is the public good? Again, in the, US, in the US context, part of higher education's public good status is that they are 501c3 nonprofit entities, according to the tax code, if they're private schools. And of course, they're nonprofits if they're public universities. What this means is that their properties are tax exempt. Now, this status has existed for decades, but in today's knowledge economy, what this means is that then when schools engage in public-private partnerships with the tech sector or biomedical companies or laboratories or military defense contractors, their campus land becomes a financial shelter for their private partners and investors. The consequence is that these schools virtually pay virtually no taxes on their increasingly pro prominent footprint as they create urban satellites in downtowns or in suburbs or, in, or in, in abroad, yet they reap the benefits of city services in terms of uh, um, snow removal, trash removal, fire, police. Now, the consequence of this is that while their the projects grow and raise property values, the long-term residents that surround these developments many times are on fixed incomes, are of low income, and they can no longer hold on when the property values rise above their yearly uh, uh, property tax payout. Or as you all know, in Ontario, single family homes get retrofitted to meet the needs of students and faculty and turn into single units or what in Berkeley, California, they call mini dorms that make them no longer affordable for single families. And yet, if they are able to hold on, because the schools don't pay property taxes, 
the maintenance of public infrastructure gets passed on to homeowners and rent and, 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 and landlords in ways that raise properties and provide no, few improvements in terms of public infrastructure. I'll just give you one quick example of this consequence in the U.S. context of a public university, not even a private university. Arizona State University realized this phenomena of using their public land as a tax shelter. So they began to lease out their land to the highest bidder. So to this day, the largest private development in the state of Arizona and uh, 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 a state farm insurance regional headquarters sits on tax exempt Arizona State University land. And the costs are passed on to the residents that surround this campus. So that's land, labor. In many cases across the North American region, universities and colleges are the biggest employers in their cities and towns. Now, these workers in these knowledge factories, we think it's primarily, we focus primarily on faculty and graduate students. But when we just look at, even if we just look at faculty and graduate students, at least in the US, we've seen that now over 60% of all instructional staff appointments in higher education are non-tenure track contingent labor. So that's one thing. But we rarely look at the fact that we say that higher education is the biggest employer in cities and towns. Their employment is not primarily focused on faculty. It's primarily the low wage ivory tower workforce of medical assistants, janitors, cooks, clerical, maintenance and security staff that keep these knowledge factories going. At least in the US, these workers face summer downside, summertime downsizing without benefits for their families. And even when in the US context, these workers unionize and engage in collective bargaining, we're finding more and more universities shifting to subcontractors which then exempts those workers from the collective bargaining agreements that are established by the unions. And these workers are given lower wages and excluded from benefits like housing subsidies and the 12 month benefit security. Finally, policing. Again, in the US context, 75% of universities and colleges have campus police, not, not not public safety, not campus safety, campus police departments. Nearly all carry guns and about nine in 10 have arrest and patrol jurisdictions far beyond campus. Now that's the US context. But even if we look at the Canadian context in the, con in, in the conversation with the US context, we see in various moments where universities are expanding their footprint into downtown areas or satellite campuses. You have various versions of ambassador or policing uh, 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 subcontractors or public safety units that are charged with serving the public good, but we find them policing in ways that are primarily focused on preserving the university experience. What do I mean by that? So there are cases where a student and a resident can commit the same, can commit the same infraction, but a student will be sent to the Dean of Students to handle it as, as student affairs. And in other cases, residents will be sent through the criminal justice system. So we're witnessing an increasing two-tier policing system. Or we find that policing will engage in various forms of amnesty for students because the general goal is to make sure that students are having a good time and that while they're, we wanna stop them from being rowdy, we don't want them to leave the city with a bad experience. We want them to stay, we want them to come back. So even in the most benign ways, this approach of preserving the university experience becomes a way, a consequence, of 
uh, uneven policing practices between students and residents, and amnesty for students in ways where they become walking bubbles around criminal activity when it comes to behavior. Maybe not so much when it comes to housing. On top of that, what happens, at least in U.S. context, is that we find policing turning its tentacles towards non-campus creations and realities, but being very silent about criminal activity that happens on campus. So what are the biggest crimes in campus areas? In many cases, it's sexual violence and substance abuse. And what we're finding in the U.S. is that campus police are over-policing the extended areas, but under-policing campus areas because they do not want to publicize or undermine the university brand that campuses could be filled with criminals. So this becomes a very important reality that we have to take seriously. So whether it be Canada or the US or Europe, where I've spent a significant amount of time, or even Asia, where I've continued, I'm starting to spend more time, many schools, as we begin to become more entrepreneurial to make up for shrinking government contributions and because of the rise of the knowledge economy, as schools become entrepreneurial, we are all at a crossroads about what has become the public good of higher education as higher education becomes the driving engine in today's political economy. But in the face of these crossroads, I'm here to tell you that there are other pathways. When I offered the observations that I'm presenting to you before at the University of Winnipeg with my good colleague, Paul Lowry, there were those who said, there are other opportunities and ways of thinking about these relationships. So I turned to the University of Winnipeg for a couple of examples. In the 2000s, uh, the city of Winnipeg witnessed a demographic shift. There was an explosion in the student population from about 6,000 to 10,000 students. But the important part about the story is that it was a different demographic. Historically, the, the, the university had been filled with commuter students who came in from the suburbs to go to school and ran out of town before nightfall. But this new demographic in this new population in the 2000s was significantly more filled with indigenous residents that surrounded the campus and those that you all call new Canadians or what we call in the US immigrant communities. And to the credit of the university, they realized that they could not engage in university development as business as usual. That if they wanted to retain the students from these new demographics, they had to look at them as, as more than just simply individual units of consumption. They had to see, or as units of consumption, they had to see them as being connected to communities and that sustainability was gonna be tied to the sustainability of not just individual students, but the communities from which they came. Part of that meant creating their own development corporation to build out housing. Their vision of sustainability included environmental. So this building here, the downtown commons and other buildings are LEED certified. But sustainability also included things like um, uh, social sustainability, economic sustainability, and cultural sustainability, taking into account the cross-cultural diversity of these new populations. So in this building here, you have a range of housing costs or of price points from premium rate to market rate to rent, um, to, to affordable, to rent geared to income. And it's open not just to students, but also Winnipeg residents. The 12 premium rate build uh, units that you see with the balconies help underwrite all the other units that in terms of their design and their building quality are interchangeable. When you move into the building, you can't tell whether you're moving into a market rate or rent geared to income unit. Moreover, the, uh, um, the uh, air ducts in the building have been retrofitted to account for indigenous smudging in the common areas. And there is free Wi-Fi in the common areas for those who can't afford private contracts. At the same time, the University of Winnipeg recently has built out a state-of-the-art uh, recreational complex. And as you all know, 
it is brick hole in Winnipeg for for a large portion of the year. So inside spaces are at a high premium in that city. So instead of making this private area, this 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 recreational facility, um. Uh, are exclusive to students, they built out a community charter whereby community organizations have access to this student recreational facility for various activities during premium times of the day. So not early in the morning or late at night, but at peak hours of the day, the community charter guarantees hours for community organizations at peak times within the day. Finally, the University of Winnipeg had a longstanding contract with one of the food service multinationals that we all know about, Aramark, Sedesco, Chartwells, Marriott, and I think there's a little Aramark. Food was extremely expensive, paying, you know, what, $15 for a chicken, a chicken sandwich and fries, over, over you know, gouging students, and, the, and it was, food was not that good. So in response, the university created their own food service company called Diversity Foods. And I was able to walk through this kitchen and find out that um, at least 60% of the workers in this kitchen come from what was called difficult to employ communities. Uh, first, uh, indigenous, um, recently incarcerated, uh, single mothers, new Canadian, refugee populations. And while I was there, they were beginning to figure out ways of talking about how to shift from not just wages, but profit sharing for the workers. On the supply side, um, approximately 70% of the raw materials for this kitchen come from small local farms from within a hundred kilometer radius. Every workstation has a compost bin and they send the cooking oil out to be converted into biodiesel. Now this might be commonplace to you all in Canada, but this was mind blowing to me in the US and the people I talk about this in the US. But this story wasn't even enough because my good colleague Paul took me to a satellite version of the University of Winnipeg in the North End, in the primarily or majority indigenous community of the North End. Our good colleague, Jim, Jim Silver, who had worked at this main campus, he realized that while this new campus was nice, most indigenous residents would never go downtown to get an education. So he asked the university to help him build out a satellite campus in the North End. They refused. So he got money from the province to build out his own urban and community studies department right in the middle of the North End, working with community partners, they built out housing for residents that was all rent geared to income with a separate unit for an elder that served as a counselor with uh, 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 childcare in the back and services for food and tutoring and instruction for high school students in the area as a gateway to higher education. So, the point here is that these examples show and inspired me to think critically, not just about the pitfalls, but the promises that can be allowed through higher education. So from this, I built out my Smart Cities Lab, where we vision the university not as simply a profit-making engine, not just simply as an anchor, but the university as a commons. In my lab, we research and consult on best practices for building out equitable urban communities with a particular focus on higher education-driven development. Because we understand that as the university, as higher education has become the um, economic engine of cities, their organization, their development, their visions of equitable development become the model for cities and towns writ large. So as goes the university, so goes the future of urban democracy. So through this lab, I have started to join with communities across the U.S. to build out what could be called commoning work. For example, I am organizing right now with residents in the Black Bottom neighborhood of Philadelphia who are still suffering from university-led demolition of their communities in the 1960s. 
just months ago, um, there was an announcement that the University City Townhouses, one of the few remaining pieces of affordable housing in the area, was being sold to a private developer, which would destroy affordable housing in the area to make way for a number of biotech and university developers that want to come be near youth, University of Pennsylvania and Drexel, who is one of the main architects of this development in this area. Surprise, surprise, Wexford Development Corporation, who I mentioned earlier. However, through the lab and through historical research, we just discovered that during the urban renewal era of the 1960s, resident protest had forced the university to agree to build multiple sites of affordable housing throughout this area, which they never did. So right now we are fighting this effort at displacement as just the most recent move in a series of broken promises and breach contracts. That's just one example. So the researcher in the lab has assessed the town and gown landscape across the country. And from this, it brings us to a series of logical conclusions. Collectively through the lab and through organizing with community groups in Philadelphia, in New Haven, Connecticut, in Miami, in Berkeley, California, in St. Louis, Missouri, in Chicago, Illinois, we call for reparations from higher education's explicit role in slavery, indigenous land seizures, which you know about in Canada, the role of schools in indigenous land seizures and shallow burial graves, housing segregation, and urban renewal community clearances. We call for reparations in the face of university's role in these activities throughout the 20th century. We also call for, in the U.S. context, payments in lieu of taxes of the university tax exemption. We call on schools to reserve a portion of their tax exempt endowments for community projects. We call for university medical centers to honor their mandate of indigent care that becomes a precondition for their tax exemption. We call on schools to attach a community benefits agreement to any campus expansion project that can include affordable housing mandates, zip code specific jobs, job trainings, scholarships, and community charters for full access to, camp to common campus facilities. It's one thing to do legal clinics and tutoring programs and turkey giveaways that are dictated by the interest and the philanthropy and the behest of the university. It's something quite different to engage in charters of governance where partners in the community and the university come together to set terms of engagement that are not simply dependent on the benevolence of the university partner. That's something quite different. We insist on the build out of community-based zoning and planning boards for all higher education related expansions, whether that be through direct university developments or private developments that seem to meet the needs of students and faculty in housing, healthcare, or amenity developments. We watch schools throw away food daily because of health requirements. And in face of that, we demand that they package that food they're gonna throw away into healthy meals for communities of need. Finally, in the US, we assess the failure of campus police and their municipal partners to address the primarily student campus crimes of sexual assault and substance abuse. And we watch campus jurisdictions extend further and further into neighborhoods and communities. And we see that there's a failure here. And therefore we call on the abolition of campus police to be replaced with teams of preventative outreach and trauma care from nursing departments and medical centers that are university related, that can meet the actual safety needs of universities and their surrounding communities. Ultimately, what I'm saying is that we need to deploy a materialist analysis. We must deploy a materialist analysis of today's political economy that comes to terms with how much higher education extends into our lives, which goes far beyond teaching classes and student housing. Within this framework, maybe we can begin to understand the magnitude of our convening here today. In some cases, universities are places that want to know, but they don't always want to be known. 
So as we think here together, let us ruminate on the gravity of this discussion and the broader implications of the campus as a commons. Beyond teaching classes and conducting discoveries and research, campuses and their private partners are the sites of much broader struggles over neighborhood stability, living wages, intellectual property rights, wealth redistribution, and public safety. Higher education is no longer just academic and therefore coming to terms with the true weight of this institution that has so intimately touched our lives, that has, has begun to pervade our lives in ways that have very little to do with education. That reality, that realization can be profound. One of the primary claims of higher education is to serve the public good and solve the world's problems. So we follow this claim to its logical conclusion. Why wouldn't we address and why would we expect higher education to address the problems that it helps create in its own backyards? But do not fret, do not cower, do not bow. This is not a pessimistic story because with higher education's vast reach into our lives in ways that have very little to do with teaching classes, this also means we have the capacity for broad social, political, and economic transformation. What does it mean when we no longer think of higher education as simply a training ground for future careers and future residents, but as a staging ground, a site of struggle for our present conditions? If we can confront that reality, that higher education is so pervasive today, then it's possible that we can embrace the reality that another university, another city, another Canada, another world is possible. Thank you so much. I welcome any and all critiques, questions, and queries. Dr. Baldwin, um, that was a amazing presentation. And just uh, confirming, can you hear me okay? Um, I can hear you better now. Okay, perfect. I will speak up and uh, make sure that I'm heard. Um, I'm going to lead off with a question to start, and then I'm going to open the floor and I would ask folks to uh, put their question in the chat or raise your hand if you feel comfortable appearing on camera and speaking. Um, so, Dr. Baldwin, um, I, really, I really liked your concept of this aspect of land, labor, and policing, and this is a thread that pulls through your entire book. And I, I did some reflecting last night after our great conversation around community engaged relationships of what that Canadian tripartite might look like. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I'm going to hypothesize and I look forward to my colleagues potentially disagreeing with me here <laughs> is uh, ours is very much a concept of land, scale and institutions. Mm. We have lots of institutions that are independent of the province, insofar as they're pretty much given free domain uh, to do with what they would like. They do have to work within their municipalities, but that also varies. I'm thinking of Dr. Laurie and your, uh, your presence at York University, a great example of a university that pretty much has carte blanche over its local campus. It operates as its own. However, we also have campuses like Ontario Tech, which uh, the city of Oshawa and Durham region have instituted in, in an unbelievable amount of land use control over the development of that campus. And that campus does not develop without the permission of the local council. And then turning to this, this aspect of scale, um, I was quite struck when I, had, I was reading the chapter on the way to Pittsburgh with my partner for a weekend on Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And we got there and toured through and we were kind of driving along and all of a sudden we ended up in U Pitt's campus. And then Carnegie Mellon was right there. And then off we were to Shady Side, which is a very interesting gentrifying neighborhood uh, in Pittsburgh. And I was just struck at the scale at which those US institutions are. It is not something that we have yet to see in Canada. I think York and 
University of British Columbia and particularly Toronto St. George's campus with the Mars Center and the Discovery Center and adding in the University Hospital Network is starting to reach those scales. But of many of our campuses are in their infancy of that level of scale and control over their local community. I, I think, you know, we're far away from what may ha what has happened to Yale and New Haven, but I do foresee the potential for that to happen. Mm. So the question I'm going to pose to you is, what do you think the mistakes are that have been made in the US context? And knowing what you know a little bit about our own context, what do you think we should avoid making those same mistakes and do instead or keep doing to avoid going down that road? Thank you, that's a great question. I think the biggest mistakes that have been made in the US context, I mean, it's fundamental is that number one, we in the 1960s, um, we decided in terms of the federal funding of higher education to not directly fund in universities, but to define, to fund students as individual consumers. So that then created a whole uh, uh, student consumer marketplace that found schools competing with each other to capture students, to bring in more out of state or international students that are bigger, that are higher payers to underwrite shrinking state contributions. And as a part of that, the debt financing that came from student debt also includes university debt to build out amenities and services that will draw students in a competitive mind, in a competitive framework. That's the, that's the foundation of what we have in, in, the high, in higher education in the US and this idea of having to become more entrepreneurial because of shrinking state contributions or government contributions to higher education. And again, the rise of the knowledge economy. And that is getting created these secondary impacts of land control, um, labor suppre suppression of wages and benefits, and the policing apparat apparatus is serving as a front line to protect the hoarding of this wealth on these campuses. And you're right, I don't think that in most cases, um, Canada is at that point, but I think that we serve as a bellwether, a warning about what's potentially coming down the pike because in Canada, you see decreased funding for higher education. And, the, and, and at the same time, you see that as I've heard all day today and yesterday, this notion of, you know, we really want to keep and retain students once they graduate. And we want to partner with biotech and innovation sectors um, because universities are the logical partner for these phenomena. And so what I'm warning to you all is that if you do this and you, and, and you, and you let housing remain primarily a private sector development, and if you let these partnerships remain unregulated between universities and these innovation sectors, what's happening in the US is gonna happen there as well. In terms of the unregulation, the lack of transparency and the fallout and the blowback washing over residents in the surrounding areas that will be just say, basically having their noses pressed to the glasses, pressed to the glass of steel and prosperity that is concentrated on these campuses and their extended housing ghettos and seeing this prosperity and trying to figure out ways to get a foothold into it. Now that might sound alar alarmist or dystopian and it might not happen the same scale but I'm begging you to begin to create infrastructures of oversight and zoning, community-based zoning and planning that will allow you to have a hand in the development of these partnerships at the ground floor before it's too late and you will be playing catch up and reacting to developments instead of having a governmental impact at the ground floor. I hope that's answered your question. That, that has, and what I will say is one of the interesting trends that we've seen among our many of our members is uh, this public-private P3 style delivery model for new student housing. Right. So not even just regular market housing being built in the community that's purpose-built student accommodation. I'm talking about residence-based housing that is filled by housing services and is delivered by a private partner on behalf of the university. Mm -hmm. And this is a model that I think has not received sufficient scrutiny mm. of what does that mean long term, particularly in the context of we know there has been a historical deficit since the late 80s in the construction of new housing on every campus in Ontario. Mm. Right. No university has kept up with development. Really, the only university in Canada that seems to have some sort of a strategy has been the University of British Columbia, but they are 
you know, kind of their own city out on Point Roberts, completely separate from Vancouver. And I would say also York University has taken a very different approach and almost a market-based approach with the University Development Corporation. Mm -hmm. That is, it, it does have large municipal investors, including our major pension plans, like the Ontario Municipal Employment uh, retirement system, CPP, and the teachers union are all invested in the York University Development Corporation for the return on investment that they receive from those developments. Yeah. And so this is where I think, you know, we have the warning signs in place, but we are not yet having the, the major and serious conversations mm -hmm. about what that development means and what that extraction means from communities. So it does, I it really... Doesn't, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean don't develop. It means... How do you develop equitably? Because one of the things I heard all over the, in, in my talk, to, this is not an anti-development conversation. Every community group that I spoke to across the country and doing this work all said, we want the university, like you all said, we want the university in our midst. We appreciate the development that they bring, but we just want to be here to enjoy it. We want development, but without displacement. We And, and that, I think it's really important to, to, to make sure that's important. And it's not just about displacement in terms of housing. As I've heard talked about today, you know, the either direct municipal policing or the quasi policing through ambassador ambassador programs, which we have, which we have in the U.S. What we finding, and we can talk about this in a minute if you want, is that they are policing or making references to policing and behavioral activities in ways that are generated or concerned in trying to preserve the university experience to make it fun for students to under-police students and over-police residents so that the area is prosperous, the area is fun, the area is an extension of the campus without being too rowdy. And so I'm saying to you, what are the consequences when your policing units are what I call extraterritorial expansion? It's not about building campus buildings and areas, but it's about policing behavior in non-campus areas in anticipation of the university interests following into that area. That's a critical, I think, conversation to be had through these ambassador programs and through policing proxies in downtown areas where you find university expansions. I completely agree. And I think that is a point of conversation that I'm hoping we carry through into dinner, but not to uh, take up all the time as, as the host here, I wanna open it up to the floor. Uh, so questions in the room. Yeah, Stephanie. Um, so within Canada, or at very least Ontario, um, there's sort of this idea that like colleges and universities are different in ways that I don't think is present quite in the U.S., where in, um, you know, Canada, the sort of conception of, uh, you know, for more hands-on trade-based, um, professions uh, that's what a college is for as opposed to a university and that occasionally has the impact where colleges usually cater to um, local local residences um, as opposed to universities where people might go um, like all across the province or to different provinces etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how colleges in particular um, have an impact on their local communities and like how that differs from universities as you sort of presented them in your presentation? Yeah, it's a great question. I can speak to the US context in terms of the difference between say community colleges and universities that might have a similar relate, uh, 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 valence here. Um, everywhere, universities and colleges and trade schools and for-profit colleges and universities are different. And some of the best examples where you find true equitable outreach are in the underfunded, undersupported community colleges that have less capacity to separate themselves from their surrounding communities. And they understand that a, a large portion of their students are food insecure, are housing insecure, and they have food banks on their campuses. They have um, housing referrals on their campuses. They have a, a whole host of support services that you don't always find at more resourced or better resourced universities. So if that is a if that's a relevant comparison, um, that applies in the U.S. context as well. But to be also to be clear, we also do find um, some trade schools or more professionally oriented schools, like a Carnegie Mellon, 
um, engaging in some of the similar practices. And it's, it especially becomes critical on the uh, research and development and licensing side that the research they're doing in these trade or practical or professional areas are being sold on the market. And the question becomes, where are those revenues going? And under what capacity are they being scrutinized? And so I'm not sure if that's also happening at the trade or professional schools in Canada, but it's something to be considerate, something to, to question or to be concerned about. Does that answer your question? I hope I'm answering your question. If, if you want to have a follow-up, I would love to hear it. I think I think you've answered the question. Okay. So, All right. Sure. Sure. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Gordon. Sure. Thanks. Um, well, Professor Baldwin, I'm Dave Gordon. I'm a professor of urban planning at Queens in Kingston, which is a city which has uh, severe town gown. Uh, problems uh, by Canadian standards uh, about running around student behavior. And I'm a big fan of your book. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could get an e autograph here. It, here and you know we uh, we can talk offline about some of the elements of your uh, your critique which uh, don't quite fit in Canada. Right. But there's one thing that um, that I'd like to hear your opinions on. You know, as an urban planner. Um, I'm quite fond in the Canadian context of the idea of university, new universities being located in the uh, inner city mm -hmm. rather than out in the suburbs. Most right. of the, the universities built in Ontario and across Canada uh, since 1945 have been built on big greenfield uh, sites like York was once with a ring road and huge parking lots and uh, lots of land for expansion in the fu future. And, um, you know, th that model is still possible and done occasionally, like the University of Ontario Technology was built in the green fields of uh, Oshawa, when I kind of thought it would have really helped Oshawa's downtown if it had been built downtown. Mm. You know, and mm. so in Canada, I've been studying the places like Brantford, Ontario, where the Wilfrid Laurier University came into a downtown that was in terrible shape yeah. Um, yeah. and helped with the satellite campus with all the vacant land, upstairs vacant apartments. Um, and the people in Brantford, who include a lot of my alumni uh, in mm. the planning department, think this is a great thing. Um, so, you know, what would be your advice if you're, uh, our, uh, so, you know, sh your stories are so horrifying, uh, <laughs> here about, um, the actions of universities and I'm not proud of what my university has been doing in terms of, uh, uh, sucking up the affordable housing in the city. Mm. Um, so should, should university expansion all happen in Greenfield remote no. suburban campuses so that it won't affect inner city areas? No, nope, not at all. Thanks for that question. Um, I, I want universities to be downtown. Residents want universities to be downtown. They want access to the to the to the uh, to the to the to the uh, common areas. They want access to the cafeterias. They want access to the lectures. They want access to the to the legitimacy that comes with having a university downtown. The point that I'm making, which I'm sure you 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 know read as well, but for those who haven't read, is that we have presumed that higher education is inherently a public good. And with that, the irony is that on one side, we talk about higher education as being great because it generates jobs, it generates, it increases land values, um, it does these things. But when we then ask for oversight, the response by many verses, oh, wait a minute, no, we're just, we just teach classes. So that dual nature of response has to be shorn up. That if you're going to have this economic footprint, this political impact, then there must be some oversight and evaluation of the terms and the conditions under which you engage with the city in non-educational ways. And that's what I'm saying. That there must be, if you're going to expand, there must be community planning oversight and zoning over these expansions. If you're going to engage in housing, there must be requirements for affordable housing for residents and for low-income students within that housing. 
and it should be university or publicly created and not just farmed out to private developers with for-profit interests. If you're going to engage in legal clinics and medical clinics and tutoring programs, if those outreach activities are not augmenting directly your harms, then it's not impactful as you think it is. If you are sitting within a predominantly indigenous community and yet your staff and your faculty don't have indigenous workers, that is not DEI, what we call DEI in the States, diversity, equity, and inclusion. These are the kinds of things I'm saying. Engage, implant, expand, but make sure that your university mission applies not just to the classroom, but applies to everything you do. In the current moment, we have these discussions and we talk about university, we only discuss the classroom. We don't talk about the laboratories that churn out for-profit research. We don't talk about the endowments that underwrite these institutions. We don't talk about the private foundations that are also in Canadian universities that help augment the, uh, the shrinking uh, government contributions. We don't talk about the cafeterias. We don't talk about the housing. We don't talk about the extension, the extended policing. So I'm saying as you engage in whatever aspect of non-educational um, uh, investments that you engage in, your mission must apply. That's what I'm saying. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin. Um, so we did get a question in the chat, but uh, I am gonna go to Dr. Lowry first. So Dr. Lowry, please. Oh, you can do the question in the chat. I don't want to jump in or anything, but uh, great to see you again, Debarian. And, and uh, however, in this way, <laughs> uh, we're going to have to get you to Toronto next. Uh, I just wanted to uh, sort of follow up on what Dr. Gordon was uh, talking about in terms of expansion in, in green fields. I think Dr. Gordon was the, the term that you used. And I'm just thinking, you know, in my current situation now, how do we deal with economic factors such as like the impending recession, the uh, absurdly prohibitively high uh, real estate market in the GTA. Uh, and I'm thinking particularly that York, as, as many of you know, with its massive uh, campus here on Keele, which is ever expanding, but also an effort to build a new campus in Markham, in the green fields of Markham, where the majority mm -hmm. of our students, black, brown, new Canadian students reside, the overwhelming number of which never go downtown and are right. unable to go downtown because of economic reasons and because of just sort of, uh, you know, other factors that are involved. So what does this look like if we are dealing with these sort of these shifting demographics, we're dealing with these economic factors? I mean, Toronto in many ways is almost adopting sort of a Parisian like a donut demographic model, right? Of, of a sort of a, a hyper gentrified, hyper wealthy core surrounded by a ring of effectively BIPOC communities, right? Of, of a new Canadian. So how do we bring the university to them? And how does that relate to, right? The, the uh, urban aspect? Yeah, I totally understand this and I get your point. Actually seeing kind of the, the outer arrondissement yeah. Uh, dynamic in the U.S. as well, um, as the urban cores become increasingly white and wealthy and unaffordable, um, while university camps expand. So you have to create satellites that bring higher education to the peripheries, if you will. Yeah. Um, all I'm trying to say, and I think that's a legitimate claim and point, and I also understand that schools are having to compensate for decrease contributions. They have to figure out ways to raise money to do, to operate. I, I, I understand, you know, I fully understand that. But at least in the U.S. context, but I also think in the Canadian context, you know, low income, uh, 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 new, you know, new Canadian um, students, they carry with them federal grants and aid that are just as lucrative as full payers. Full yeah. paying, full paying work, but the problem is mental in our in our, our in, in our higher education administrative framework. 
then we're still chasing the full payers. And we're still chasing a, a model that would meet the needs and interests of suburban or white students. And so my right. point here is that if we actually don't turn to austerity in the face of shrinking budgets, and we lean into those grant, those grant bearing students of color, you have to create different services and different approaches to the higher education project. You actually do have to build out housing. You do have to offer food services. All the things I've been critiquing, you have to provide those things, but they have to be done in an equitable way. Mm -hmm. Not in a way just to extract wealth to meet the needs of the university, but to meet the needs of what's becoming increasingly your dominant student demographic right. and your dominant labor demographic at the low wage sector. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so that's what I'm saying. It's not to say don't do yeah. these things, but do them with these communities in mind and not just profit in mind. Because they're actually, it's these communities that are actually going to make higher education sustainable, not yeah. chasing the unicorn of the full paying white students and their families who are just frankly not having children. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. For Thank that you question. so much, yeah. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to go next to uh, the, the great mayor of Thorold and a longtime town and gown supporter, uh, Mayor Terry, please. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, DeVarian. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you you uh, touched on some items that have uh, highlighted some of my real concerns and uh, um, I just want to say, though, Brad Clark's on this call, and we've been working on some very uh, forward and progressive uh, initiatives uh, as a team with our community partners, and uh, I'm, when we're already seeing the results. So, as, I, as I want part of the lab, you know, we do the research, we share the information. I would love to hear more about what yeah, you guys. Yeah, we will. We're working on. Uh, trying to uh, work towards an MOU, uh, and we hope to have that done by the end of summer. So by all means, uh, we would like to share that if we, you know, if we reach our goal. Yeah. Uh, one thing that you mentioned, uh, we're, we are playing catch up. I want you to know that. But uh, um, one of the things that's tough and, I, and why I really like uh, uh, what you said about uh, being in control of community planning, that's so essential, and especially... Our community is about 23,800, and we have a large uh, portion of uh, students that uh, from Brock that live in the city of Thorold during the school year. Probably you add on to that another five, 6,000 people. And uh, in a small community, that puts a lot of strain. Um, when you talk about affordable housing, one of the problems we have is today uh, with this housing mix and density targets, they're building a lot of townhouses. The problem is the townhouses are supposed to be the affordable first step. What they become is they get bought up by investors and uh, they get rented out six to a unit. So what you've created is actually unaffordable housing because mm -hmm. the average family can't compete with that. So that's one thing that we're working on and uh, working on trying to get more purpose-built student housing. And uh, we're, uh, we actually... Uh, uh, I have a unit, we have a project underway now that eventually will be uh, six units across from the university with a thousand beds. So we're really excited about that and uh, hope that'll take some pressure off our residential areas. But um, I think the, uh, that, that part and the uh, part about the uh, costs associated with extra policing and bylaw uh, puts extra strain on our, on our community because we have to put that on the back of the taxpayer, right? So mm -hmm. that's where we're working with the university and we've got come up with some unique uh, ideas and uh, ways to partner and work forward. So I'm excited about that. Um, and I'm gonna take some of what you said today and hopefully we'll be able to integrate that in what we're doing. So I just wanted to say uh, thank you. And uh, I, I've learned more today and I think everybody here has learned something. Thank you so much for the comments. And I, again, um, even if you don't push it through, I would love to see how you guys are working through it, the documents or anything you would love to share, willing to share. I would love to see more because we're trying to share best practices across, across the, across, you know, the countries. And, and this is how we all grow. Um, stories you're talking about with the, 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 the breaking up of single family homes or townhouses into small units, you know, again, in Berkeley, they call those mini dorms. Um, I just spoke with a, a council person in St. Louis, and he says that, you know, not only are private developers doing this, but Washington University in St. Louis 
they're buying up single family homes in their community and then turning them into student housing. And this does two things in the U.S. context. This takes those houses off the camp, off the tax rolls because they become because their campus, they become campus properties. And number two, it raises property values all around these houses beyond the means of long term residents. And it makes those housing unaffordable. So this is a story that cuts across the border in very vari in variations that we've got to keep talking. We got to talk about. We got to share stories. We got to share practices and solutions. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have a question in the chat that I think um, is a, a really great one. Uh, yeah. And it's sort of what do you believe has been the most inspiring, proudest or important conversation moment or experience you've had within the work that you've been doing so far? And I know you mentioned some yesterday, but yeah. I would love to hear more about this. Yeah, the first thing that comes to my mind is one of the first points of interface that I had with a community group during the summer of 2020. When uh, you know the racial reckoning that came around, uh, you know George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, et cetera, um, there was a huge conversation in the U.S. that couldn't be had just six months earlier around police abolition, um, because people realized that police were not doing, they're not helping communities of color, and what police abolition actually meant was not so much ending of public safety, but it meant divesting in carceral armed policing and investing in the actual needs of trauma care. Uh, 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 public services, um, housing security, uh, um, you know, domestic violence services, that that was what was required. That was necessary. And But then when people began to think about policing in their communities in the U.S. context, they realized, a lot of people realized the biggest policing agents and force in their communities was not city police. It was campus police armed with city jurisdiction, with arrest powers, and they began to turn to my work. And they're like, listen, you're doing this cute little, you know, information sharing with your lab, but we don't want information sharing. We need advocacy. And so the city of New Haven that sits in the shadow of Yale University, one of the most powerful universities in the world, small city of New Haven, Yale dominates that, that city. It is the biggest employer. It is the biggest real estate owner. Is the biggest policer. It, it polices. Yale has the jurisdiction of the entire city, and is the biggest healthcare provider in the city of New Haven. And but because of that, most of the workers in the city work at Yale. Most of the residents either live in in, in Yale-owned housing or near Yale-owned housing. So because of the perva the pervasive nature of Yale, people began to organize. They began to turn away from Yale and turn to each other in creating this organization called New Haven Rising, which is a coalition of students, residents, labor unions, and also city council members who are all, who have become increasingly also a, a labor, or, labor, or, labor oriented, members of labor unions that actually work, and many of them work at Yale. So in the height of their campus organizing, they're like, you know, listen, we, Yale is the biggest landowner and it doesn't pay tax on its properties. And our schools are in, our public schools are in shambles. Our, our K through 12 schools are in shambles. There's a direct correlation between the money they, they the prosperity and the money they don't pay and the condition of our schools. So they started a major Yale pay your fair share campaign. And they brought me down to speak at rallies, to offer op eds, to, um, and I wrote a piece in Time Magazine in, in, in the spirit of them. And I talked to residents, working class, black and brown labor organizers and residents and workers. And they were like, wow, you know, we thought we were alone. We thought we were isolated. And here you are, you're putting our story in Time Magazine. And you're talking in an everyday language. You're bringing your university scholarship to an, through an accessible prose. And you're speaking these rallies. And you're saying things that I've known for 30 and 40 years but you're saying them from, from the ivory tower and I feel seen. And, and that's just been some of the most gratifying work that I've ever done. And you know, you know, you know higher education, we always thinking about the next project, but this work and the work coming out of the lab because of contacts like that, relationships like that, getting, um, getting reached out to from uh, community groups and politicians and cities and towns across the country, I can imagine doing this kind of work for the for the remainder of my professional career. 
It's not gratifying. I believe it, it is a it is a uh it is the manifestation of what has been what was always meant to be my calling, my vocation, the bringing together of my academic scholarship with my academic interests through the lens of higher education as this engine and this this arbiter of urban democracy. It brings together so many things that could keep me busy for the rest of my time as an academic. And so that's a long story, making a short story long. That has been my most gratifying set of experiences um, that I, I will continue to carry with me. And it gives me a sense of responsibility to do this work that goes beyond simply a publication or an award from a university or a book club. It's so much bigger than that. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin. Uh, so I think we're actually going to wrap it here, but okay. uh, I know that uh, I, you will answer your emails for folks if they have uh, more yeah. questions. I think there are many more conversations that we as an association are gonna reflect on how we best engage you in your lab um, and share information. I know uh, the work that Brad and Terry have been doing has been great. And I think also there's work that's happening in Waterloo as well. And, London mm -hmm. and Kingston uh, and Guelph actually too, which hasn't come up in conversation today, but uh, Guelph and their Chancellor Way project, I think is another one that's really interesting to uh, think about. So I want to thank you so much for giving us uh, a lot to think about, but also a, um, a cautiously optimistic and positive lens in which to look at what we are doing right here. There was a lot of things that I saw in your presentation and I go, hey, he's telling us to do that, but we already do that. Yeah. We do that well, and mm -hmm. we should keep doing that. And I think, uh, you know, this has been really exciting for us to, to think about a different perspective, um, as well as, you know, reflect on our own potential flaws and blind spots. So I want to thank you so much for presenting today. And uh, I cannot wait to welcome you to Canada in person and have you uh, tour here in Ontario and see some of our great communities. AJ, before you go, I just want to say thank you. You don't, you all don't know this, but AJ has put to, you know, all the work he's done with this conference, and he put together an amazing time for me to visit if I had been in person, which was going to be amazing and wonderful. And I, I thank you for finding me and, and and putting me in this community. And I I just hope this is just the beginning of information sharing and collaboration as we go forward. So it's wonderful to meet you all virtually. And I really do hope to be able to be there with you in person at some point, share a pint, share a meal, break bread, and build this out beyond just simply the virtual realm. So thank you so much, everybody.